welcome to another episode of Read It With Whiskey. My name is Laura Gentinen and I am your host. I am a self-published author of the Shockwave series. Book two is coming out really, really soon, you guys, so keep your eyes out. But this episode, we are going to be talking to Nathaniel DeZago and his book, Cries of Battle, Selstra. Nathaniel started writing when he was 17. He turned his love for science fiction and military into the first attempt at Cries of Battle. After college, he went straight into Army Infantry and was able to continue writing throughout his service. After getting out of the military, he moved to Seattle, where he earned an associate in creative writing at Pierce College in 2015, and he continued working on Cries of Battle. He was then suggested to rewrite the whole first book and create a more unique and fresh approach. That ended up in a final edition being completed in 2016. Nathaniel is also the father of four children, so I don't know how he was able to complete this book and work on multiple sequels. <laughs> so let's talk about Cries of Battle Selstra. This is book one of the Cries of Battle series. Princess Sierra Leandri joins the Raptor Battalion with her royal squad to uncover the threat disrupting the human planetary trading routes. Stalled by their allies, the Veal Nations, Sierra helps discover a faction within the Veal preparing to wipe out humanity. Following Captain Jake Muros, leader of the Raptor Battalion, Sierra realizes her squad is not going to survive the war. With each loss of her sister soldiers, Sierra fights to focus on the war rather than become distracted by her personal struggles. Physically, mentally, and emotionally, Sierra struggles amidst the cries of the war with humanity's survival, survival's guilt, and the interest of the heart. We unpack so much in this interview. Me and Nathan could talk for hours. However, we weren't able to keep everything within this episode. So if you want to learn about more of the sneak peeks, a few spoilers, things like that, then you definitely want to head over to Patreon at patreon.com slash readitwithwhiskey and become a viewer. Becoming a viewer gives you the ability to watch the video interviews for all of the episodes on Read It With Whiskey. Every single audio episode that goes out has that video content alongside of it, and it is released on Patreon a little bit after the audio goes out. So probably about a month after the audio version, the video version goes up, just to make sure that I don't put too many spoilers in there for the audience. So that is on Patreon, patreon.com slash readitwithwhiskey. You can be a listener, a listener plus, or viewer, and it would be greatly appreciated if you joined and helped the podcast grow as a sponsor. All right, let's get into the episode. Welcome to Read It With Whiskey, the interview podcast featuring science fiction and fantasy authors. My name is Laura Gentinen, your host and the author of the Shockwave series. I am also a book club moderator, speaker, and avid reader, truly invested in every author's story. Within this podcast, I bring to you, the reader, all the behind the scenes secrets to how these guest indie authors bring their books into the world. If you are a sci-fi fantasy reader, then you need to hear from these authors. Let's learn about the person behind the page. Sit back, sip some whiskey, and lean in to these self-published authors. All right, and here's a little Laura J. Live update for you this week. Currently, I am still working on Oscillation Rising. I have the book out to beta readers, and as this episode goes out, I am on my way to Michigan for a family reunion, so I'm going to be not working for the next week or so. Um, So we'll see when I can jump back into Oscillation Rising, but I want it to be coming out this summer, so keep your eyes and ears out for that. Other than that, I have just been trucking along with reading and editing and writing and podcasting, all that kind of stuff. And if you want the full update for everything that happened in July, then definitely head on over to Patreon because that's where all of the behind the scene episodes are, talking about my indie author updates, more extensive than here in the regular episodes, as well as the books I read episodes. The books I read episode for July is incredible, you guys. It will be up this weekend. I read 15 books in July, and I will tell you all the secrets on how I made that possible within this episode. So definitely head over onto Patreon to listen into those secret episodes. This episode of the Read It With Whiskey podcast is brought to you by Coffee Over Cardio. I've been using Coffee Over Cardio for a really long time, and I'm so excited to be an affiliate with them. So there is a link in the bio, but if you want to go there on your own, all you got to do is use my code 10LauraJLive, that's 10-L-A-U-R-A-J-A-Y-L-I-V-E, and you will get 10% off your order. Nathan, and welcome to Read It With Whiskey. How are you doing today? 
Oh, I'm doing wonderful this morning. <laughs> oh, that's good to Wake, hear. Waking up before the sun decides to wake up too. Yes, it's a bit early for us, but that's okay because we're just trying to make sure that the kids don't interrupt. So <laughs> you gotta gotta sacrifice the time sometimes. But I'm so excited to have you on the show today, and we are gonna talk all about your book. Cries of Battle, Selstra, which is the first book in your series. But before we dive into the book, tell our listeners a little bit about you and how you became a writer. Well, uh, high school and pre-high school, I was, uh, I did not like English. So I was not a whole lot into the writing scene. But my junior year, one of my teachers did write. And at the end, he was our, he was my last, uh, last period of the day. And he, he wrote up a story. He started writing up a story, like a short, whatever, crazy story. And it was just really, really funny. So I guess I kind of tried to mimic it, even though his were comedic and mine turned into war. (laughs) <laughs> even in high school people died <laughs> oh no and yeah, oh, yeah. That, that's a little plug into uh into what your <laughs> book involves um and so you kind of knew you always wanted to be a writer then after that yeah I like I just love to just t- put out a story and write and it's always been it has always been sci-fi I'm a I was a large Star Wars fan I am a huge Halo fan as well basically I took those two elements and turned my own into it there you go I guess you could say. <laughs> <laughs> mash up the interests into into a book and yeah. a lot of people do that it's either something they're really passionate about a theme they're really passionate about like me I had a dream and it was like a nightmare and that's where Mike came from definitely life inspires um so are you a full-time author do you have a part-time job or you have multiple streams of income tell us a little bit about that I am part-time writer and I work in a mine for a mining company in the earth, in the ground, getting, gathering raw materials. So I, I work in heavy, work on heavy equipment. I don't know how much I can expound on that. It's pretty (laughs) self-explanatory. All right. Well, there you go. Yes. And is it a dream to be a full-time author or are you just keeping it as a hobby on the side while you're working? I would love to be able to just sit at a computer and type all day. <laughs> <laughs> and you have a lot of content to think about. So we're going to get into that about how much history you've had with this book series with only the one book out so far. You've got enough to have an entire 10, 12 book series, I'm sure. Depends on how much you want to write, I guess. <laughs> exactly. How many books do you have published right now i just have the first one published book one is published uh book two is written and in need of final editing into publishing and then book three i've got the first couple chapters down they are their works in progress they're on the way <laughs> they're progressing they're, they're not uh they're not the final book of other series and so and so tell our listeners what is cries of battle selstra about tell us a little blip about what the book is cries of battle is is a large space opera war book, you know, human versus alien, you know, there's first contact humans, and this is in another galaxy. So there's no, it's not earth based. The main character, Sierra, is the heir to the throne, the only heir. From an early age, she wanted to be a soldier. She like researched the different branches and went up to her father one morning was like, this is what I want to do. This is what I'm going to do. (laughs) <laughs> and so the, the king kind of, well, if I don't agree, I'm going to alienate her. So I'm going to go ahead and uh, make it as safe as possible. So he created, he put out a conscription for 15 others to make a royal squad. And the book follows the royal squad in the war between the humans and the aliens, which the aliens themselves are a collective of multiple species that are bent on wiping out humanity. We dive straight in within the war and you just you just dive straight in and then it follows this team through a bunch of different things. The back of the book even says Sierra real- realizes her squad is not going to survive the war. So with each loss of her sister soldiers, she fights to focus on the war rather than becoming distracted by her personal struggles. So you know right there people are going to die. <laughs> I had to reread the back of the book like midway through and I was like Nathan why are you killing off all of my favorite people (laughs) hey there it goes I I did get an angry call from a friend when one of when one of the characters died a while ago when that happened and she called me up and she's like you just killed my favorite character Mm -hmm. what are you doing I'm just like well it's a war (laughs) that's how and that's how I write I write it as a 
you don't know going into the fight, you don't know who's going to die, which is in my opinion, realistic as you know, that's how soldiers go in. Mm -hmm. They go in knowing it could be their last, but, and it could be the guy on their left's last. I write with the realist, the realism of that. It's a realism of life. And that's kind of how I felt as I was going through it, because like you just said, you don't ever know who's going to be able to come home. We're going to dive a little bit more into that in a second, but before we dive into more of like the character plot lines and everything like that, first of all, why did you decide to self-publish this book versus traditional? Timing. And honestly, my self-publishing is a little less 100% self-publishing. I did go into a what's considered the novelty publishing side. You pay for the publisher to do everything for you. They give you a book and then you have to market it all. So I've been writing it for several years over 20 almost over 20 years and i just wanted to get it into print you know they offer oh we offer it on these different platforms which is great and that's one of the things about self-publishing you can put it on whatever platform you want you can take it off of any platform you want mm -hmm. so you know you can you have that control and flexibility when you are self-published and the traditional publishing route it can take longer than you want after so many years of waiting to see this in print i just was like hey you know what get it out there and it got published and the world collapsed so because january 6 2020 and then a month later the world shuts down <laughs> some people found that they were able to sell more books other people found that it really hurt their sales just depending. And then also with war related books, any kind of books that have to do with survival, things like that, a lot of people shied away from them because really? they felt they were like living that world. And so they wanted to escape into romance or into comedy. And so mine has romance in it. It does. Yes. <laughs> and mine, mine has mine has moments of sarcasm and funniness. I, I really did like the sarcasm that the group of people have, like the banter between the women in the, it was really funny. I, <laughs> I was actually like laughing out loud as I was reading because it had my type of banter with the sarcasm. So that was well, fun. And and I tried to capture, you know, that sarcasm does go on in the military. Mm -hmm. I tried to capture all of that. And, you know, it is coming from experience. I am a veteran. Mm -hmm. So I'm not just writing a war book with no idea what I'm talking about. It does have a bit of realism. I, I hope it has realism with the science fiction aspect of it. There is actually one one story in there that actually happened. A, a guy told me about his one of his experiences in Iraq, and I put that into the story. So is anything else inspired by real life? Like, what was the inspiration behind the entire book? Is it something you've been thinking about for a long time? So my sci-fi, it was mostly my sci-fi-ness. I did, at the beginning, me and a friend were trying to come up with a idea for a movie cool sci-fi movie. I was going to do the writing. He was going to do the video. And I kind of just kept going with the writing after we kind of just split our ways. Mm -hmm. And I mean, it, it was just a one weekend cool idea. Right. I wish I could find the sketches that were done. But and and that's that actually t ties into how I how my writing style is. I write I write as if it's a camera following the action. And mm -hmm. so I'll follow one person and then I mentioned to somebody else, and that's the camera angle turning to follow that person. It can feel like it's chaotic, which again is an aspect of war. War is mm -hmm. chaos. I also write as if it's a one, just one shot camera angle following. And I'll divide the scenes up, obviously, but in the action scenes, I'll just follow and then, oh, why am I following this person? That's the whole, that's the whole point of it. It was a deliberate writing style of the whole thing. That's yeah. interesting. I like, I like the point of view. And now that you say that I can see, or I can remember reading scenes, I'm a very internal visual person. So when I'm reading, I'm visualizing what I'm reading. I can actually go back to scenes that I read and I can picture what I saw. And that actually was happening <laughs> where I was looking at one person, then it would switch over to somebody else. Cause that's how the writing was. That's interesting. I, it, translated correctly then <laughs> well and, and i get you know i get some people they can't they can't process that just like there's some mm -hmm. writing styles i can't process either but my you know that is my writing style and if people don't get it hey i i understand it's a space opera sci-fi i mean it is a young adult i advertise it as young adult because there's it's fairly clean aside from violence mm -hmm. and it's mm -hmm. it's you know i'm not a violent person i believe in there there is a time you know there's a time for everything there's a time for mm -hmm. war and a time for peace 
I write the war. You know, book one is defensive, book two is going to be offensive, and book three is well, I haven't I haven't developed the full theme. <laughs> we'll find out. <laughs> it, it's it's going to be it, it'll play off of book two, so I can't say too much about that. So I'm glad we talked about the writing style because I wanted to bring up it is very tactical the writing style because there's a lot of weapons and a lot of spacecrafts and different alien species that you talk about. And so it's definitely something that I don't usually read. I'm not usually a space reader. And so that was kind of tough for me at the very beginning, learning how to read your style of writing with the tactical pieces and things like that. Cause usually I'm like fantasy and princesses and <laughs> or there's romance. Or... What else do you need to know? And so there's some dwarves too. Don't, don't forget right. them. And so it was, it was interesting diving into it. Once I got into the, the characters and like the plot line and everything, it was, I was invested. I was like, okay, what's going to happen to these people? I was intrigued by the tactical uses. One thing about the tech is one theme for humans versus alien fight. It's always the aliens are out teching the humans right. and it's a, it's an underdog story. The underdog part of the humans is they're outnumbered. They're, they're masters of nanotechnology. They have exceptional skill with the nanotechnology, but they're outnumbered. I mean, it's like massive 20 to one over 20 to one, you know, a unit of a, a veal, a unit of them is 120 and a battalion of knights, the humans, 64. And you have 20 units versus maybe three battalions, mm -hmm. if you're lucky. So the humans are outnumbered, but they have better tech. They have better training. It's a war of attrition. You're just, you know, if the humans lose 50 and the aliens lose 500, aliens are just going to throw in 500 more and the humans are going to be like, we have to withdraw. So, and, and you know, so the, the so the tech, I, I do love some of the tech that I make. The lay shot in particular, human round, it fires a projectile, but the projectile is laced with nanotechnology that on impact of flesh, it liquefies into a molten metal that burns internally. That's so cool. <laughs> and so well, where did that come from? Where What inspired that? My own idea. And I like a couple years later, and I, I kid you not, I came up with the uh, with my idea before I saw this movie. I, I swear. In have you seen the movie Underworld? So. It's a vampire. It's a lichen versus where a uh, vampire. Oh yeah, I, it's a while back. Yeah. Yes, Kate Beckinsale. So the werewolves had a ultraviolet bullet, and the vampires developed a liquid silver. Well, it's like the liquid silver. That's the concept that I had created before I saw the movie. You can't heal yourself from a internal burn. It doesn't cauterize either. It doesn't harden it just it travels through the bloodstream and it'll kill you it's a nasty way to go yeah it doesn't sound pleasant at all i do have a glossary wiki on my website that i am slowly updating as i edit as i work more and more in the universe i wish i had had the glossary at the beginning because then mm -hmm. i could access it while i'm editing book two a lot easier you know i don't delve too much into the economics or the the, the little things of the universe in book mm -hmm. one there is a lot more. I do toss in a couple more of those things within book two. So if people are, you know, they read book one, it's like, well, what about this? There is a lot more to be unpacked in book two because one, I recognize I didn't throw it in there in book one. Because like I said, book one is your defensive. You know, right. it's it's one battle after another trying to stay alive. That's how I wanted it to be set up. And book two is, it's not more relaxed by any means. It's just, we can go on the offensive now. And so there's more from just that statement. I feel like, I feel like like there would be more planning. They're going to plan more on like how they're going to be offensive versus, okay, we have to protect. And so there's going to be more on that side, which would be necessary in war as well. Book three is going to be, is totally uh, opposite of book one and two, if right. you could imagine that one. All right. So let's dive a little bit into the characters of the book. So there's, there's a lot of characters that come to play. I had to start taking notes because I was like, I don't want to like mess up who's who, because there's a lot of people it's war. There's 
going to be a lot of different players in action. But I want to say my, I really enjoyed um, Sierra, which is the main princess character and she's the heir of the throne. I really liked her and her whole, like I already mentioned, the banter between her and her squad. So I really liked her character and how she interacted with her other people. Um, she basically called them her sisters because she grew up with them learning how to be in war. From the age of six, that's six-ish. You know, there were, mm-hmm. there was one hope. She's mm-hmm. one year older and Adrian is one year younger. The king did try to keep the age group within. But yeah, all of the, all of the girls, I really liked, I really liked their relationship. And then- Who was I- your favorite? Not, not counting Sierra. Who was your favorite of the squad? So that when, so that when that character dies, no. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And that was, that was basically what happened is I really liked somebody and then something happened and I was not very happy about it. But no, I just, I just liked the banter between them. And, but anyway. Just to let you know, the, the older of those two was what my friend got mad at me for. Yeah. <laughs> Yes. Oh no. <laughs> yes. I, I apparently rewrote her character really well still. So mm-hmm. I'm glad for that one. Book one is a rewrite of my original. So when I was writing originally, I had five books, okay. just not unpublished five books. And I kept on editing and editing. It's like, I don't like this. I don't. It's what, you know, new writers do. We just right. continue to edit. So I attended a small book club, a writer club. And a suggestion I got was, well, just rewrite it. Mm-hmm. Don't rewrite what you have already written. Start with a blank page. And so I did. And where the death of the third character happens is mm-hmm. where book one originally started. So rewriting it, I started 20 some chapters prior to where mm-hmm. book one originally started. Book one ends where part one ended. So your your original book is now going to be basically maybe three. Basically, I, I'm yeah. starting book two where part two would have started and book two, the, the original writing of book two hasn't even come into play yet. Yeah. Isn't, isn't that interesting how when you write the book kind of takes control and they're like, nope, we're going to do this and, or this character is going to be introduced and they're going to have a huge plot line later. And I'm like, I don't know who this person is. And that's why I'm a, I know I'm a pantser. I've written outlines and I'll follow the first outline bullet point. Mm -hmm. And then I'll realize five bullet points later that I'm nowhere near where I originally started. It's crazy how the book kind of takes control. So were any, were any of the characters that are in this book, were they not originally in the book? Maddox was a different first name. I changed his first name. Uh, Shelton was still a pilot. The original squad is still the original squad from book one. I lost my note. I have no idea where my notebook from all five books are, which is where my sketch is as well. You know, I'd battlefield diagrams and all that different stuff, which are pointless now because it's been rewritten. Um, one thing that I am trying to get done is a an official timeline so that people can see that because even I get confused sometimes on the actual year. So something else that I really enjoyed with like talking about scene transitions and things like that. In every chapter, you have basically a little blip of information from somebody. When I do the when I do sections like that, I'm I'm cheating the story. One of the things that I like that can annoy me if it's not done correctly in a mm-hmm. book is when people get into lengthy, oh, it was this, 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 and this. Well, just tell me the story. Right. Get, to this, get back to the story. Stop describing the history of this. The, the chapter preludes are sometimes cheap for me. But so, I like... Go ahead, finish your question. Yeah, no, I like that because it kind of gives... Yeah, it gives the information that your characters aren't going to be talking about it or they're not going to be able to know that type of information. It's basically written as if it's from far in the future and they're talking about their past. The inspiration was just to... It was your own writing tactic to be able to skip through the long slog of information. Yes, it, it's okay. my way of, uh, as you said, slogging through the mm-hmm. information. I don't want to lose the momentum in describing, you know, there's a funeral for one character. It was a, it was the first character who died. That's an important moment. After the second character died, I did a journal entry mm-hmm. about it at the next beginning of the next chapter. We don't need to know a funeral for every single 
character. So just do a, a blurb at the beginning saying it's acknowledged that this person died and it affected Sierra, which is, you know, is the main theme of, you know, Sierra has to deal with survivor's guilt. She has to deal with all the other guilt that gets balled up into when somebody gets killed and you don't, or you weren't there to see if you could have saved, you know, that there's all that guilt floating around and it has to be acknowledged that it's happening, but at the same time, it can't weigh down the story. It can't weigh down the, the flow of the war. And I think that's same for it can't hold back the characters either, because in a time of war, you can't really let your emotions cloud the surface, unfortunately. And sometimes yeah. you have to just keep fighting through in order to get your job done. And so by having that feel for the reader at the same time, I think they understood more why Sierra has to push down her feelings and just keep moving forward because the reader is forced to do that, too, through this type of writing, which I think is important to the whole story. So one character that I do really want to talk about is your character. So yeah. you actually created someone based off of you. So tell us about that. Who is this character and why did you decide to write him? Nathaniel West would be my character. Back in the day when I started writing it, you know, it's like, I can't be the main character because that would just be too, one, blatantly obvious and just kind of a little arrogant too, in my opinion. It's like, <laughs> right. you know, I'm, and I wrote this before I was in the military. So I made myself a sniper before I was in the military. I was not a sniper in the military. I was just a grunt. It was just one of those, yeah, I'm going to add myself into the character, into the story. I have other friends in this, in the, I put other characters who were friends of mine in the story. And by the way, some friends do get killed. And it, I was going to ask that. <laughs> I, hey, it's, I'd make no exception to anybody, including myself. I do not make exception for who they are. And I tell my friends that as when I got their permission to make them a character. One person that I put in book two and I told her that her character died. She's like, oh, that's awesome. How did I die? I was like, <laughs> okay. First names are usually kept the same, but mm -hmm. I do change last names. There was one character I did change a first name to. So I know who they are. Yeah, you know the inspiration of, of who they are. And so do you visualize when you're when you're writing, do you visualize those friends as the characters then? Some of them, others have kind of evolved into their own character. I'll admit that. So even my own character is like, I don't really envision myself like that because I wasn't like that in the military, mm -hmm. but my character is. So mm -hmm. it's it's another one of those examples of the character just takes over. The right. characters really do take over when you write. Is it a reflection of myself? As all authors and writers will admit, all of their characters are reflections of yourself. Mm -hmm. In some way. You just have to figure out which one. Even the, even the bad guys. Even oh, bad yeah. guys are reflections of <laughs> the good people that are the writers, you know? Mm -hmm. Like, of course, I want to take over the world, but I'm better than that. I don't have to be. The, I'm not the bad guy, but it would it be cool to take over the world. Yeah, sure. Why not? Uh, in my book, there is not a real antagonist. The antagonist mm -hmm. are the aliens. Book two does start with a scene with an alien. So I, I do break that ice of the camera is not just on the humans. Mm. Oh, I'm intrigued. And I make the aliens out to be very... Their, their attacking and battle tactics are very colonial British. Their tactic really is line up 40 across, four rows deep, and just march with your the blasters going. Right. And if someone just, falls, take their place kind of thing. So you have 40 across just spraying lasers at the enemy as you war march towards them until you get to the appropriate distance. So they get into the range and then they charge. So in book two, there is a, with the glance of the Mechelin, which mm -hmm. are technically the same species, but they're also a maturity. It's a maturity issue. So you got the, the three-year-olds out on the front line before they mature into the 10-year-olds. Sacrificing the young. <laughs> the strong will survive. So the, there is an antagonist in book two, which does perpetrate the death of a character. We're going to we're going to get into spoilers if we talk any more about this, I think. Me, me drinking me having a sip of coffee is my way of keeping my mouth shut. OK. <laughs> All right. So we dived into a lot of different things here, but it wouldn't be rooted with whiskey without talking a little bit about whiskey. So what is your favorite whiskey to drink? Whiskey is too strong for me. I do admit I am a lightweight, even though I was infantry. The last time I had whiskey was 
in Afghanistan. One of the guys had gotten whiskey in the mail from the States and I did the mistake of taking a Coke can, drinking half the Coke and then pouring in whiskey. So, you know, it'd be like a mixed drink, right? Right. (laughs) Easier to drink, get a little bit too drunk. (laughs) I did not mix it correctly. I I prefer the wine. I did find a a bottle of wine that was aged in a barrel of bourbon and it was aged three years in it. It, Did you like that wine more than others or was it? It wasn't bad. It it definitely had the smoothness of of a harder liquor. So Mm -hmm. you could tell it was not the same as regular wine. So if you keep drinking that, maybe you'll come to the dark side with me and have some whiskey eventually. <laughs> I'll sh- I mean, I'm a social drinker. So mm-hmm. if, if, if somebody else is drinking it and they know how to mix it yeah. or they know how to prepare it, I have no problem with that. So can you tell our listeners, where can they find you? Where can they find your books and learn more about you? My primary site is NJ Dezego. That's November Juliet Delta Echo Zulu Alpha Golf Oscar.com. <laughs> <laughs> that was good. <laughs> it's NJ Dezego.com. And that's pretty much my primary site. I am trying to break away from social media. I do have a Facebook facebook.com slash Selstra. And then on Mayway, I am more active and I will do, I do postings on there occasionally when I have updates. If you read the, if somebody reads the book and they want to comment on it, please comment. I I enjoy here, even if you don't post a review, Mm -hmm. I enjoy hearing, Hey, I liked this character. I like that character. Why did you kill this character? Right. <laughs> why, why didn't you kill this character? Which yeah. I, I doubt that that'll ever happen. <laughs> All right. Well, this has been so much fun. I learned so much about the book that I did not know. So that's one of the reasons I love doing these interviews. So thank you so much for being on the podcast. I had fun. Absolutely. Thank you for having me. Like I said, me and Nathan could talk for a very, very long time, and we did. I think this was probably the longest recording that I had for any interview, and I did have to cut a lot of content. So if you want to dive in that extra content, that video is going to be up in about a month on Patreon. So patreon.com slash readitwithwhiskey. You might as well join now because there are a bunch of videos that you can go and watch, and it will fill your time until Nathan's video content is up on the website. So these episodes, I want to keep these interviews right around 30 minutes. I want to keep it short and sweet and to the point, and that's why any type of extra content is going to go on Patreon, and that's why I would love for you to become a sponsor. Go ahead, visit the site, and tell me on Instagram. DM me, tag me. I would love for you to share on social media, share about the individual interviews that we have done, um, that you've listened to, or if anything really spoke to you. Let me know if you've purchased any of the books too, because that's another reason I do this podcast. So then these authors' businesses can grow, so more people can find them, and they can sell more books. As readers, it is your responsibility to make sure that you're reading the books you're interested in. It helps the authors so, so much. And if you do read the books, Go leave a review. If you've read my book, if you've read Nathan's book, if you've read Jack's book or all of the other people I've interviewed on the show, go onto Goodreads or Amazon and review their book. That does so much for our business. Okay, so next time on Read It With Whiskey, I have a really fun guest for you guys. His name is Todd Micah, and I actually won his book, which is an anthology of dark fantasy called Tales of Grimgard. I won his book. I won an etched glass, a candle, some chocolates, a bookmark. I won all of this in a bundle on Instagram. It was a freebie bundle. If you put your name in, if you shared the content, you got put into the raffle. And you guys, I won. And I'm so excited to bring him onto the show. His book, Tales from Grimgard, is an anthology of dark fantasy. There are 10 stories within. And you guys, I'm really hoping he turns all 10 of these stories into individual books. That's how good these short stories are. So tune in next time when we come back for episode three of season two of Read It With Whiskey. I'll talk to you then. You've been listening to an episode of Read It With Whiskey. I am your host, Laura Gentinen, and I just wanted to personally hop in and say thank you so much for listening. Your support of the podcast means so much to me, and I would really appreciate it if you could go onto your favorite podcast platform and rate and review the show. By rating the show, you're going to help more people find the podcast so then we can grow. 
Once you review the show, share it on your social media, share your favorite episode with your friends, and come back next time to hear more from self-published authors. I'll talk to you soon.